Okay, today we will talk about hat, human African trypanosomiasis. Talk a lot about tsetse flies. Can I, is it gonna allow me to, there we go, tsetse flies. Uh, human African trypanosomiasis, the pathogen, uh, whoa, something's going <laughs> strange. Uh, the pathogen are trypanosomes. Uh, and we'll talk about how this relates to Chagas disease, but how it's a little bit different. So with respect to trypanosomes, this is just kind of like a simple hierarchy. So there's different, and actually this is a little bit even too simplistic. So uh, there's trypanosome diseases. Um, and within this family, there's also a, a, close, a closely sort of related pathogen, closely related disease. Um, let me also just say, so kinetoplastids. Somebody fact check me on this. Is kinetoplastid above trypanosome or is trypanosomes above kinetoplastids? So let me just Google that quick. But there's two kind of like terms for diseases related to this. I think trypanosomes is under kinetoplastids, but you guys check that quick for me. Otherwise this would be wrong in public. Yeah. It's, it's like this? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, I got it. my guess was right. So there's different types of kinetoplastid diseases. One of these is Leishmaniasis, Leishmaniasis, um, and this you get, they have, this is spread by what are called sand flies, and you get this in places like, um, they have it in Afghanistan, so a lot of like the U.S. troops when they're in Afghanistan, some of them, or one of, at least one of the concerns would be that they get Leishmaniasis. I eventually want to have a lecture on this, but I haven't prepared that yet. But that's a separate topic, but it's related to within diseases caused by kinetoplastids. Now there's other diseases caused by kinetoplastids which fall into the trypanosome family. And there's a lot of these in vector biology. So some of the ones that we'll talk about today are, and there's it's kind of like a bifurcation, there um, is Chagas disease. Okay, this is a disease caused by trypanosomes and then there's also what we're calling HAT, human African trypanosomiasis. And then there's also AAT, AT, which is animal African trypanosomiasis. Okay. So these are just kind of um, a hierarchy of sort of like pathogens and diseases that we're going to talk about today. And in terms of like colloquial names, HAT, the colloquial name for that is sleeping sickness. So this is called African sleeping sickness. And the colloquial name for the animal African trypanosomiasis is Nagana. I read that Nagana is a Zulu word, which means um, depressed spirits. And we'll talk about why that like that kind of like that name, why that translation, I guess, makes sense with respect to these diseases. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So with just that brief overview, um, okay, so before I introduce this, I might as well just introduce the species names. So with Chagas disease, the pathogen is Trypanosoma cruzi. With human African trypanosomiasis, the species of the pathogen is trypanosoma brucei. And then there's important sort of like substrains that come after that. But the brucei strains are causing the hat and the at. And so it's important to remember that the species of African trypanosome diseases is different than the species of South American uh, trypanosome diseases. That's an important thing to remember. And also the vectors are different. So the vector of Chagas disease is a redubid bug, which I'll talk about in a little bit more. And um, the vector of these trypanosome diseases in Africa are tsetse flies. Okay, so just looking at these slides here, there was a person named David Bruce who was investigating um, outbreaks of this disease amongst British colonists. And the pathogen was then named after Bruce 
so which is why it's called Trypanosoma brucei. Um, that's where it gets its name. And this is just some of the history of it. You don't need to memorize that. So these are the these are the vectors, the two different vectors of the trypanosome. So this is the reduvid bug. We call this the the kissing bug. Um, you have these in your lab. Ifan has these in his lab. If you guys want to study them, um, this is a blood. It's a unique case of a blood feeding hemipterin. Most hemipterins feed on um, plants. I guess bed bugs are hemipterins. So I guess there are other um, blood feeding hemipterans, but this is the kissing bug. Why is it called the kissing bug? Yeah, it, it bites your face. So if you're sleeping at night, um, if you, if, and, and it's, it's is particularly bad if you live um, in South America and you and live in thatch roofs because the kissing bugs sit up in the thatch roofs. And then when you go to sleep, they come down at night and they bite your face, which is why they're called kissing bugs. Um, and the disease is spread by, it's like a mechanical transmission. They will poop out the disease, the trypanosomes, and then you'll scratch it in. Something like that is usually how this disease is spreading. So this is in the South American variant. This is, a, this is the vector of the African diseases, the tsetse fly. So this is in diptera order. It's got two wings. It's a fly. Um, I, I'm going to talk more about the vector in a little bit. Mm, sorry, I'm going to jump around here a lot in these slides. I want to talk about the kinetoplastids now. If I can get a picture of them. Here's kind of, is this Leishman? Yeah, this is to do the kinetoplastids. So, Kinetoplastids are these strange um, single cellular eukaryotic organisms that look kind of like this. And they have like this big flagella. So if I was to like draw this out, what these things look like, um, they're like this thing that looks like this. And they have this backbone, which is like this flagella. And inside them, they have what's called, what's like a fused mitochondria. Um, and it's kind of like near this big giant flagella thing. And so when they are originally looking at these, they would stain these with DNA stains and they could see like a big blob of DNA in this, in this big large mitochondrion. Um, and they called that the kinetoplastid. So it's like an organelle. And then all the kinetoplastids sort of like morphologically look like that. Okay. So Guess, guess some functions, like why would they have this particular mitochondria? Let's make some hypotheses. Like why would they have this funky mitochondria next to this big giant flagella or flagellum, just like a backbone? Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. like, they need to move, yeah, exactly. So like, and this is actually what happens in sperm, is in sperm, which their function is to swim, Sperm actually take their mitochondria and they and they fuse all their mitochondria and they kind of like squeeze them out to be like elongated. So sperm actually have like a fused giant mitochondria. And my hypothesis is that this is kind of the same thing. It's a fused mitochondria, which is providing power to this giant flagellar thing so that it can probably swim. That's that's fact check me on that. That's my hypothesis. Um, okay. Talked about that, talked about that, talked about that. Okay, so now let's talk about where these things are. So 80% of African trypanosomiasis is in the Congo. Um, and uh, Daniel and I were just talking about the Congo and we were just describing it as it's, it's not the most stable place. So a lot of the research on tsetse flies and uh, African trypanosomiasis is difficult to do because it's not always a good place to be sending graduate students. And not only is it just sort of like an unstable place, but you're also like in the jungle, which again, that's another sort of thing that not a lot of graduate students want to do, go into the jungle. So there, uh, it's, it's hard to get research done 
on, on this, but there's some unique aspects of the system that suggest that we could get rid of this disease. Some interesting things about this is, I feel like I have so many notes to write. Let me, let me start a section on notes about human African trypanosomiasis. So 80% in the Congo, um, it's a couple interesting things about it. It's not expanding. So this is kind of different from the other cases of vector biology that we've studied in terms of like filarial worms or viruses or malaria or plague or typhus. What do we worry about with those diseases? Like we worry about them becoming epidemics and spreading and expanding and exploding. We don't really worry about that with trypanosomiasis is not really expanding. It's kind of like been in this endemic region in the Congo for like hundreds of years. And it's kind of been like that for the last hundred years. And it's just kind of sat there for like the last hundred years. So we don't really worry about it expanding. Um, and one of the reasons it's not really expanding is that the tsetse flies are kind of like a, they're kind of like a bad vector. They're not, they don't really have great vector competence. They're not really good at spreading the disease, but they will spread it. So in the Congo, if you look at like um, the flies, about 10% of the tsetse flies have the trypanosomes inside of them. So if you compare this to like, like endemic regions of Lyme's disease, where the ticks are like 99% infected with Borrelia, like you can see how this might be one reason why it's not really expanding. But the CC flies is not always in a lot of the CC flies, um, and they're kind of a crappy vector. So in terms of like the statistics of the disease, it's also in decline, like some of the other vector-borne diseases we've seen. Recently, um, I don't know when, maybe I'll say 10 years ago or five years ago, 90,000 cases a year. And just recently, um, it's been reduced to about 70,000 cases a year. So it's getting better. Again, and this is a pattern we're seeing with vector-borne diseases. We are getting better at dealing with them as humans. So it's getting better. Uh, and there's reason to suggest that we could get rid of this disease entirely if we focus in on it. Um, Now let's talk about those species. Well, let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. So there's, there's, two, there's two species. Do I have them here? So here's where you find, here are regions where you find one strain. Okay, so I, said, I was wrong when I said species, which is called Trypanosoma brucei gambiense. So there's like a, this is, let me look at that. It's like Northern, yeah. There's like a Northern African strain, which is, and you want to remember this, Trypanosoma brucei gambiense. Okay. That's like the, that's like the Northern strain. And then there's a strain down here, which is Trypanosoma brucei rodien, rodiense. Did I get that right? Rodiense, yes. Okay. And there's differences between these strains that are really important. Let me get a new. Let's talk about the differences between these strains. So there's Gambiense, and there's the Rodiense. Okay. Rodiense is worse. By worse, I mean it kills you faster. You will die from this. Um, and it'll kill you within nine months. Now, the nice thing about the Rodiense strain is it kills you so fast that it doesn't infect the CNS. What's the CNS, just for a review? the central nervous system. Okay, so let's compare this to the Gambiense strain, which is considered like the better of the two to get. Okay, you're less likely to die, but 
this one will survive in you for years. So this one, if you get it, you can have it for, you know, like four years. And over that course of that time, it will invade your central nervous system. And from what we know about encephalitis, what do we know about diseases that invade the central nervous system? What are some of the pathologies that come out of that? Sequel it. Yeah, like, yeah, you have lasting effects for sure. That was good. Remember that term. But it's, they affect like, oh, I'll see the chat. They can mess with the brain. Yes. And so what happens when you mess with the brain and actually end up like messing with behavior, like messing with cognitive, be, cognitive thinking and behavior. Um, and so you can now see why the Zulus would call Nagana depressed um, spirits because, and why the colloquial term for these diseases is sleeping sickness. Because when you get these diseases and they go into your central nervous system, you don't sleep very well, you have trouble sleeping and you come, become very, very, very tired. And so it seems like you're always in the perpetual state of like zombie, like grogginess and you can't work very well. Um, and, and so it essentially like you turn into kind of like a zombie almost. So there's kind of like really scary effects from these diseases. So here's a, here's a picture of a victim um, of Trypanosoma brucei gambiense. Okay, um, not a good thing to get. Um, this is the, the, the Nagana. Let's just talk, spend a second talking about the Nagana. Nagana is also like another nasty thing you don't want to get. So it's the same thing. It's, it's a different strain though. It's, it's what we call Trypana, Soma, Brucei, Brucei. Okay, so now we have four strains of trypanosomes. We've got trypanosoma cruzii, which is South American Chagas disease. We have trypanosoma brucei gambiense, which is a North African strain, African sleeping sickness, which infects your CNS. We have trypanosoma brucei rodiense, which is the one that will kill you real fast. And then we have now trypanosoma brucei brucei, which is a strain that infects animals, okay? And this one is also like really a big issue because um, if, imagine if you are a cattle farmer in a developing African country and you want to start raising cattle to raise your standard of living and all of a sudden your, all your cattle get this Nagana disease, like that now your livelihood is essentially done for. So this is a big issue in both medical entomology and also veterinary entomology from an agricultural perspective. So there's a lot of interest in trying to figure out how to get rid of this disease and how to solve sort of all these problems. Okay. You've heard that rodiense are resistant? You're saying there are animals that are resistant to this. That wouldn't surprise me. I mean, there would be a lot of selection to like um, develop resistance to this. That might be true. Okay. So let's talk about some of the reasons that this disease, these diseases are different from some of the other things we've looked at in the past. So in terms of the trypanosomes, and we're talking about brucei, they are never intracellular, never intracellular. They're not replicating inside of other cells. So this is different from malaria. Plasmodium is replicating in your liver cells and your blood cells. This is different from Rocky Mountain spotted fever where bacteria are replicating inside of your endothelial cells. Different from um, Yersinia, which is replicating inside your cells. So this is kind of unique in a sense, it's one of the few diseases we've looked at that's not intracellular. It's, it's replicating um, in your blood, but not in your blood cells. 
Now in Chagas disease, it will go intracellular. So this is unique to African sleeping sickness in Nagana, where they're not intracellular. Now, another unique thing about this disease that's unlike the others is there's no, it's a, well, I should say, okay, let me preface by saying it's a eukaryote. What are eukaryotes famous for besides the nucleus? Oh, did you say sex? Yes. They're famous for sex. That's what eukaryotes do. Sex evolved in eukaryotes. This is a eukaryote that doesn't have sex. So there's no sex. And um, you can remember back to the malaria life cycle where much of that sex sort of drove the life cycle where the malaria are the picking up the gametes and then they're, rep they're mating in the gut of the mosquito. Similar with the flarial worms, like part of their, they're trying to figure out like where it is they're gonna have sex and where it is they're gonna mature. In this case, the trypanosomes, um, there's, no, there's no sexual cycle, okay? So it replicates by binary fission, even though it's a eukaryote. Yeah, so it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's, well, I mean, I guess like, I, these are yeast cells that, well, in yeast cells, budding yeast, they'll bud like this. Fission yeast will grow long and then they'll cut in half. So I'm assuming it's probably something like this, but what I'm essentially saying is they clone each other. Like it's the, the, the way that they replicate is a clone of a clone of a clone of a clone recursively. There's no sex involved. Um, but, but people are studying if it's possible that sex is happening and where it would occur and what the, what the results of that would be. So I would say people are studying sexual cycles of these trypanosomes. Why would that be worthwhile? Like why, and we'll talk about this specifically, like why would people want to waste their time studying sexual cycles or non-sexual cycles of these weird trypanosome diseases? Why is that worth their time? Yes, but what about it specifically? Like what, not disease control in the sense of like sterile insect technique, not, not like that. Yeah, so what's the purpose of, let me rephrase that. What's the purpose of sex? mixing it's recombination really like the purpose really like the usefulness of sex is because it provides mixing reagents through recombination of chromosomes okay so you're taking one thing mixing it with another thing you get these recombinations there can be huge evolutionary innovative advances to that that's why sex is useful so now that you know like we drew okay perhaps i can't draw africa <laughs> Something like this. Um, we drew that. We drew that picture of Africa, and up here I said there's uh, a strain of Gambiense, and here is a strain of Rodiense, and I said these are different. Like one of the things that we're concerned about is at this zone where Gambiense is mixing with rodiense, maybe there are situations where a tsetse fly picks up both and are there situations where they have sex? And if they do have sex, what would we worry about? Yeah, we would worry about whatever makes rodiense really, really nasty and able to kill you in four months. We worry about whatever those traits are being passed to the other population, which is not so bad. That's one thing we worry about. So there are people who are studying the sex of these creatures, like in these kind of like, I don't know if you'd call them hybrid zones because they're not, the, they're not different species, but in these zones where these different strains are mixing, they're studying sex scenarios. So let's ask the question, um, this is also worth talking about like experimentally, sometimes it's good to think these things through. How would you measure this? How would you answer the question how would you answer, do Gambiense strain 
and Rodian say strain, do they have sex? How do you, how would you answer that question? Genome sequencing. So that would be the first step. What would you genome sequence? You could probably do it by looking at mitochondria, but I'm thinking more like broadly, like, like, so first, what do you sequence? Sequence what? Well, let's sequence the whole genome. Let's just say we're going to straight up sequence the whole genome. But what what will we sequence? It's genome sequence of what? Yes, the two original strains. Good in the chat. Very good. So the first thing we need to sequence are like the controls. The controls are like, like let's take a population that's furthest away from that hybrid zone and let's sequence the Gambiense genome. Let's take a population that's furthest away from that hybrid zone and let's sequence the Rodiense. I'm going to spell these. I'm just trying to write it fast. Rodiense. Okay. Then let's compare their genomes and let's find all the differences. So let's say this one is different in like 200 SNPs from this one. So let's say there's 200 SNP differences, single nucleotide polymorphisms. If you don't know what I'm saying, SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. Let's say there's 200 differences between here and here. What are you going to see? if they're having sex. Now what's the next experiment? So let's continue that. The next experiment is now genome sequence something else. What's gonna be the something else? No, we're gonna still sequence the whole genome of the organism. So we're not, it's not gonna matter what tissue. In the strains, if they bred. So in the chat was written, is genome sequence in the strains if they bred. So. To do that, you could do this two ways. You could, in the lab, you could mix the strains in some kind of a culture, and then you could see if you could then isolate the culture after passaging them together for a while, separate them out again, and then you'd genome sequence them. And then you'd look for some of the SNPs that were in Rodiense, have they now appeared in Gambiense? Then you know there is mating. Or if you don't want to do it in the lab, you collect from this hybrid zone, collect from this hybrid zone and start to genome sequence those and see if you see SNPs from here popping up in Rodiense strains from down here. Does that make sense? Then you kind of like know if they're having sex. So that's actually an important question that people are looking into. And the value of that is that then if we can understand how they're mating and how they're having sex, we can sort of answer the question of are some of these virulence factors going to be passed? And is there ever a scenario where this will become a, a, well, where the Rodiense characteristics will expand into the Gambiense's territory. I guess, are there actual I'm saying this is an active question of researchers right now. What if we like, um, have a situation where it's not, they're not on the screen, they're like, the best way to deal with tsetse flies and tsetse fly borne diseases is vector control. That's the next part where we're going to next. So just hold that thought. Um, let me just finish talking about the trypanosomes by talking about, I'll come back to this, but just quick talking about the transmission. So in the tsetse fly, there's two mechanisms of trans, uh, transmission. One is the tsetse fly will vomit the um, trypanosomes up. The other one is there's, it's actually like classical where they can get, the trypanosomes can infect the salivary glands and then they can be injected. And the tsetse flies themselves are tephrids, or not tephrids, uh, telmophages. Too many, too many T entomology words, telmophages. So they have razor blades that will slash the skin. And in some cases they're vomiting up the trypanosomes and in some cases they're spitting out the trypanosome into this pool of blood. Okay. CT flies are really cool. Um, cool in bio biological sense. If I, can, uh, I guess I don't have, I do have pictures. Okay, let's talk about the CT flies. So both males and females bite. So this is a scenario where it's not like the mosquito where just females bite. It's more like the tick in the sense that both males and females bite. Okay, so both males and females taking blood males. They're telomophages. 
So they're going to slash the, here's what their mouth parts look like. They're going to slash the skin, pool blood, and suck it up. They are holo metabolists. Okay. So that means they're going to have, well, I'll go into this in, in detail because this is a very interesting life cycle. But just remember for now, they're holo metabolists. So they go through larvae, pupae, adult stage. Okay. Um, the genus, and you want to, re you need to remember this. You do need to remember the genus and one particular species. There's a bunch of species, there's about 30 different species, and there's different species that spread trypanosomes. Okay, so it's not just one species. But the ones that we worry about the most, because they overlap with humans, the genus is Glycinia, and the species is Morsitans. So you, what you want to know for the test is if I say, what vector, what is the vector of African trypanosomiasis, it's Glycinia morsitans. Okay, I'm answering that test question for you right now. What is the vector of African trypan trypanosomiasis? It's Glycinia morsitans. Okay, although there are other species. And the way that you tell, if you can't tell that this flies to tsetse fly just by looking at it, they have a cell called the hatchet cell in their wing, which looks like it's this thing. It looks like a hatchet. Okay, so if you see this hatchet cell in a fly that comes from African jungles, uh, then you got a tsetse fly. Okay, let's talk again. Tsetse flies are so interesting. Let's talk more about the interesting biology of tsetse flies. Okay. This is one of the first insects we've seen that is K-style reproduction. What, what is K reproduction? It's maternal investment in a very expensive offspring, investment in offspring. So our K style gonna have lots of babies or a few babies, a few. Okay, so that's the first thing. This is the first unique thing that we have ever seen. I don't think we've seen a vector like this before in class. Each CT fly is gonna have one to three babies each female in her lifespan. So not anything like mosquitoes where a female is having 100, 200, 300 uh, eggs, not anything like a tick where a female is having 4,000 eggs, nothing like that. Okay, those are our strategies. This is a case of K strategy reproduction. Um, not only that, there's something else that's unique is to make one of these babies, it takes multiple blood meals. Most of the time, in most of the cases, takes one blood field from an adult to generate eggs. So a female just needs one blood meal, lays eggs. A tick adult just needs one blood meal, then it can lay eggs. Although earlier stages of ticks need blood meals to go to the next stage. But this is unique in the sense that the, the adult needs to successfully capture multiple blood meals. Okay, so multiple blood meals, K-style reproduction, I'm listing all the, ins the, all the reasons why the tsetse fly is really the case scenario for like, if you could ever be successful at vector control, it would be the tsetse fly because there's not very many of them. They don't have very many eggs and they have to take multiple blood meals to like be successful to actually like m even lay one egg. So like, this is the this is, if you can't do it here, like we can't do it anywhere. Um, okay, what's the other really, really unique thing about CT flies? You guys maybe have just heard this by their reputation. Yes, they make milk. They're almost like mammals. They uh, have, there's a term for this. It's called adenotrophic Vivi parity, and I put a link to it in the lecture notes that I updated. So if you want to read the Wikipedia on this. So in terms of like animals and biology, there are terms, one term is oviparous. This is a term that means they lay eggs. Okay, so there could be like oviparous fish, there could be like oviparous insects, there could be like ovip oviparous, maybe like chickens are like oviparous. Okay, they lay eggs. And then there's a totally different style of 
of sort of like investing in your re, uh, in your offspring, which is called viviparity. This is what humans are. This is where the embryo develops inside, inside the mom. And this is not, um, what we could say is that this is convergent evolution in a sense that you see this thing evolve different times in different organisms. So in mammals, where they have gestation periods, where the embryo is inside of you, that's viviparity, okay? But also tsetse flies are viviparous and they, what they do is they grow the larvae, they grow larvae in a uterus inside of the mama fly and the mama fly, while it's in there, has milk glands and makes milk and feeds the larvae milk. Like, and there are people who study like, what are the milk proteins that make up like the tsetse fly milk? So like, this is just like the most interesting system. Um, and it's a really unique case in entomology because most bugs lay eggs, right? This is a, there are, there are other cases of this in entomology, but it's a rare case. It's a rare case where in a bog, it's even rare to find like a case style bug, I suppose, but even rarer to find uh, a denotrophic viv viviparous insect. So this is a really unique thing about CC flies that make them very interesting to study. They become pregnant. Okay. So, There's some, some, there's some more thoughts about, where did I have it? I lost it. We'll come back to that. Okay, let's go back to the slides. Trypanosomes have antigenic variation. So just like many of the pathogens I've talked about before, like plasmodium, like Borrelia, like the syphilis pathogen, um, like I don't know if Rickettsia, I'm sure Rickettsia probably does it. Um, but also too, trypanosomes do the antigenic variation, okay? So if you remember, the antigenic variation is the idea that you have one strain of this pathogen and it's really successful at infecting and it replicates and replicates and replicates to higher and higher levels. And the host, which is hosting it, then develops the antibodies to recognize that. And then it starts killing it. And you start fighting off the infection, fighting off the infection. And then selection kicks in and it's like, well, if you don't figure out a solution to this problem, you're gonna be dead soon. So then they swap out their outer membrane proteins like we discussed. And then you get these repetitive cycles of changing the outer membrane proteins, bumping up to high reproductive uh, loads and replicating, developing a new antibody response, response. And then you just get these cyclic curves. Okay, so it's hard to get rid of trypanosomes. That's the important part of this is treating trypanosome diseases is hard because they have the antigenic variation. And specifically their mechanism of antigenic variation they have in their genomes, we've sequenced some of their genomes, they have 1000 paralogs of what we call VSGs. What do you think VSG stands for? Excellent variable surface glycoproteins. So hopefully you guys, you, I mean, you've, I've kind of hammered this a lot. Like if you have these outer surface proteins, they change them. Oftentimes the outer surface proteins are glycosylated so that they can bind to like certain things. So trypanosomes have 1000 different copies of these and they're constantly mutating them, switching them out, recombining them to get new innovations, new sequences. Uh, it's very easy for them to switch uh, and then start like a new infection cycle. Okay. Let's look at what happens if you get this nasty disease. If you get bit and you get this disease, it kind of looks like urethrema migrans, the Lyme disease symptom, the bullseye rash kind of looks like that. You get this nasty rash, then you start to develop this ulcer which gets pus and ooze and it gets infected. Okay. And then usually what happens is the trypanosomes go to your lymph nodes. Okay. And you get these weird swollen like nodules 
kind of like, um, I guess, like bubonic plague almost. So I guess in that last lecture, I said there's nothing else that does this. I guess uh, trypanosomiasis does this a little bit. You get these like swollen lymph nodes, okay? And then from there, they'll infect your blood. And then if you, you then you'll either die or they'll go into your brainstream, your CNS, your cerebral spinal fluid and your central nervous system, and they'll infect those and start changing your behavior. Okay. So in terms of like the treatment of this, so treating this is, is, is difficult. Well, let's also just talk about, okay, so like why is it difficult to treat eukaryotic pathogens? Like we, we've, we're kind of taking some things for granted. Like we don't really worry about plague. We don't really worry about Rocky Mountain spotted fever. We don't really worry about um, typhus anymore because what do we have? We have antibiotics, right? Like, so those, that's why one reason we don't really worry about those. Why are eukaryotes, why is it different? Why is it harder to treat eukaryotes? Yeah, we are eukaryotes. So it's like, okay, let's develop a drug to kill these eukaryotes. Oh, it also like kills you. So that's why it's easy. It's in some sense, it's not easy, but in some sense we get lucky with bacterial diseases because they're kind of like a totally different thing. Like we can develop drugs that just hit them. When you start to develop drugs to hit eukaryotes, like um, pathogenic fungi, or um, things that are kind of like fungi, like plasmodium, single cell pr uh, protist organisms, then you start to get into scenarios where you're hurting yourself, but maybe you're hurting them more, okay? And so developing drugs for them is hard. So that's the first thing is that it's difficult to treat eukaryotic diseases because of this. Um, <clears throat> trypanosomes do not have endosymbionts. CT flies do. CT flies do. And that was the strategy for uh, filarial worms, which was a clever trick. So you're right. That would be a clever strategy if the trypanosomes were found to have some crucial like endosymbiont. But they themselves are a single cell organism. I'm not ruling it out because they're amoebas, which have intracellular infections. And the mitochondria itself is kind of like a little infection, but we wouldn't think of them as something that typically has like endosymbionts. That'd be more like the host insect, like the tsetse fly. Um, okay, so treatments. It's difficult to treat eukaryotic pathogens. We can't just make a vaccine because it'll just switch their coat. Um, it takes, if you get this, if you get this disease, we do have some drugs for it. So we do have drugs, but the other reason why this is difficult to treat is, right? Like I said, there are 90,000 cases a year. Are you gonna make a lot of money by developing a drug that you can market to 90,000 people? No, like you're not gonna make any money. So in one sense, like it's kind of cynical to think that the pharmaceutical industries are only in it to make money. And um, what it's just like, it's just sort of like a fact of life that if you can't, if you can't like generate profit, it's not going to fuel the production of new drugs. So we don't have a lot of drugs um, and people are not going to make a lot of money. And the drugs that we do have are going to be really, really, really expensive because it's gonna be like, if you buy like a rare machine that nobody wants, it's always like really expensive, regardless of how hard or easy it is to build because the demand is like in a strange situation. So the drugs that we do have, they work, but they're expensive. And usually you have to treat for about, if you get this, you gotta to go to the hospital, you get treated, you, you're in the hospital for like 30 days, okay? It takes a long time to get rid of, a long time. And even after that, because it's a because it's a sort of central nervous system invader. Some drugs in human bodies we have what's called the blood brain barrier. What does that mean? 
yeah, we do not just let like things go into our brain. Like brains are protected for like the specific reason that they are like the central, right. It's like the central nervous system. So we do not just let things go into our brain. So even if you develop a drug that say works really well in maybe like treating the trypanosomes that are in the blood or treating the trypanosomes that are in the lymph nodes, that drug is not necessarily going to cross the blood brain barrier. And then if you just have, if you're just killing the trypanosomes that are in your bloodstream, but you're still, your brain is infected, like that's not going to do you any favors. So we have to develop drugs that also cross the blood brain barrier. And if you are in a late stage of infection with African sleeping sickness, they're going to give you drugs that are able to cross that blood brain barrier. And then even after those, like, even after those take effect, you have to repeatedly come back month after month after month to get your cerebrospinal fluid tapped. And then they'll check to make sure that like you don't have trypanosomes still in there. So it's a hard disease to get rid of. You don't wanna get this. So the drugs that we do have, um, you don't need to memorize this. I think I have it. I think here's the name. I don't memorize these names, pentamidine, but I do, I do kind of know the mechanism. The mechanism of this drug is it messes with polyamines. So polyamines are um, charged chemicals in our bodies that our cells make, and they have a role in stabilizing DNA. And actually, if you do any biochemistry with um, nucleic acids, or sometimes you get into situations where you want to purify nuclei, oftentimes you will mix in polyamines and things like that. So if you're a biochemist, you will, you will see polyamines. You'll see that term a lot. This drug that we have that treats trypanosomes, it messes with the ability of polyamines, polyamines to function in the kinetoplastids. And they can't metabolize the drug, so it sits there and it keeps continued effects. But in our case, uh, our cells are able to metabolize this. So they found a unique drug that sort of it, it kills them, but it doesn't kill us. We can metabolize it. Okay. Okay, let's talk in the final sections here. Let's talk about um, what Dee mentioned the vector control aspects. The vector control aspects of this system are also really interesting. This is the prime target. Uh, we can, because it, it doesn't have that many offspring, if we can interrupt that transmission cycle or kill the vector, we can have big significant impact on transmission of African sleeping sickness. So there's a lot of things that people have done. In the 1880s, one of the things that they did is they literally just went out and they killed a bunch of ungulates. So ungulates, I think are like hooved animals, like uh, deer and like antelope, things like that. And in Africa, where these things were, there was a period where they just went out and they just like killed a bunch of animals. And that helped, like that helped reduce the tsetse fly. Although that might not be like the most, the most efficient way to do it. But we also saw that pattern in Lyme disease where like if you kill the, uh, if you kill the deer, the ticks go down and the Lyme disease go away. So this is actually kind of like a proven method that does kind of work. You just kill a bunch of animals, okay? But maybe not the most practical, maybe not the most environmentally friendly. So then what they started doing is they started actually just, the rationale was, well, maybe we don't, we don't have to kill the, the ungulates that the sea flies are feeding on. Maybe we can just fence them in or limit their movement. And so what they started doing is they started building like fences, which would prevent these animals from moving into certain regions where there would be humans around, okay? So if you can just keep those jungle or savanna animals away from humans, then you're also keeping the tsetse flies away from humans, right? So you can just sort of develop strategies to control the movement of the feeding source or the blood source of the tsetse flies. And then that can have an impact on the spread of the disease. So that's one strategy that is popular that they do. Another thing that they do is tsetse flies are really dumb. So if you just put up, so what, the, what they're attracted to, the tsetse flies are the famous example of where trapping insects works really well. 
So you might think it's a ridiculous strategy to trap a bunch of in insects and think that that's going to have an impact on vector-borne diseases. But it will work in tsetse flies because there's so few of them and, and you only have to you only have to trap a few to have a big impact, right? So what you can do is they're dumb in a sense that they just see, they just look for black, okay? So they find like some of the animals that they feed on, they're dark and have dark fur. And so CC flies, if you just put up like a black box or like a black piece of paper, the CC flies will go and they'll land on that piece of paper because they think it's uh they think it's like a blood source. So what people literally do is they take these like black uh, poster boards, they lace them with insecticides. So you spray them with like insecticides, okay? And then anytime a tsetse fly lands on that surface, it gets some insecticide on it and it dies. So what they figured out is they actually like calculated how many, how many of these like, and these are super cheap to make, right? Like you just print off paper, put some insecticides on it. The hard part is getting it out into the jungle, like putting it in the jungle. And they can actually calculate like how many traps per kilometer do you need to like reduce the CC fly population by a certain amount. And so then what they started doing is they started interlacing this with like satellite photographs. So if you take satellites and you take photographs of the jungle, based on like how green it is or like the colors that come out, the spectrum of colors that come out, you can kind of tell like what, what plants are there and whatever plants are there is gonna dictate what herbivores are there eating the plants, okay? So then they can take satellite photographs. They say, okay, well, where are the feeding sources of the herbivores that the CC flies feed on? Where are they? Let's put traps there. So now what they do is they take satellite photographs, okay? They analyze with some computer algorithm and they decide, okay, put a trap here, 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 put a trap, here, put a trap blah, 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 blah. And somebody goes out and put the traps. So they do that with CC flies. So it's a really interesting example of vector control uh, and it's a really unique system. Okay, so I'll just finish with an intro of what we're gonna be doing next lecture. So CC flies, as Dee mentioned, they do have symbionts. And they have, they have about three symbionts. They have Wolbachia, they have, I think, Sodalis, and I think they have Wigglesworthia. But there's unique situations where the symbionts affect the vector competence of the tsetse fly. And we're going to study some of that, and we're going to use the tsetse fly in the next lecture as a model system to understand how differences in vector competence can mechanistically like be produced in the organism. So I'll end with that.